Enlightenment rumblings notwithstanding, the 18th century, or at least the 18th century up to 1789, was the great age of the aristocracy. And one of the delights of life as an aristocratic young man was taking an extended grand tour of Europe, especially Italy. As these wealthy young Europeans flooded into Italy, they, like to all tourists, hunted for souvenirs to bring home. This busy and jumbled painting was commissioned by a young French nobleman who shone circled in red, looking at a guidebook, maybe with some of his traveling buddies. I trust you recognize the works I've circled in blue, yellow, and green. Starting in 1748, the Bourbon Kingdom of Naples began sponsoring excavations of the ruins of Pompeii and Herculaneum. This isn't an especially famous painting, but it shows the excavations at around this time. And here's a modern photo, but it gives you a sense of why visitors found these ruins so compelling. Artists who had been traveling to Italy for inspiration since the Renaissance, but now they scurried to meet a growing demand for paintings and engravings of Roman ruins. There was serious money to be made with this kind of print. Remember Pompeian wall paintings? These were uncovered in the late 18th century, and they set off a wave of imitation. So here you see another Pompeian fresco on the left, and on the right, one of our required neoclassical works by David. And here's a late 18th century drawing room in an English aristocrat's country home, redirect, redecorated in the popular Pompeian style. British pottery entrepreneur Josiah Wedgwood, remember he was a major patron of Joseph Wright of Derby, sold thousands of classically inspired pottery pieces. So the page on the right is an advertisement for his bas-relief ware with classical symbols. And here you see a famous British neoclassical country home. So what's the most obvious Roman model for this work? Ah, yes, our old friend, the Pantheon. But we're skipping an intermediate step, a work that used to be a college board favorite, but, you guessed it, has dropped off the list. However, I can't believe they mean it, since it's impossible to talk about Monticello, which is a required work, without considering the model that it and the Chiswick House you just saw were both based on. Palladio's Via Rotonda. Note the date. We're back in the High Renaissance, and we're actually back in Venice, or at least the countryside near Venice. So here's what Wikipedia has to say. Andrea Palladio is widely considered to be the most influential individual in the history of architecture. Now, that may be one of those where somebody should make a correction, but it's a pretty strong statement. The uh, entry continues, all of his buildings are located in what was the Venetian Republic, but his teachings summarized in the architectural treatise, The Four Books of Architecture, gained him wide recognition, but not, and this is a McConnell addendum, a place on the list. As you can see from this country villa, probably his most famous building, Palladio's architectural style employed symmetry, mathematical perspective, and elements of classical temple architecture, such as, well, we see a pediment, that's the triangle, remember, an entablature, a dome, and even sculptures on the roof, go Etruscans. Palladian designs proved especially popular in England and in the American colonies and then the New Republic of the United States. It's easy enough to see the appeal of this elegance to the English aristocracy. They didn't tend to go for Baroque with the same enthusiasm as French aristocrats. But what would you guess was the appeal in America? Well, the leaders of the new nation, when designing their own homes and even more when designing public buildings, were looking for an architecture that echoed the traditions of the Ro Roman Republic. Uh, they actually valued the Roman Republic more than what they saw as the rather unruly Athenian direct democracy. And, of course, they wanted to convey the seriousness and staying power of the American governmental experiment, and they wanted to be fashionable, and they wanted it to be beautiful. So here's the rotunda that Thomas Jefferson designed for the University of Virginia. Little shades of the Pantheon, right? 
How about the U.S. Capitol? Note that like the Villa Rotunda, it includes a dome rising above a temple facade with a pediment and Corinthian columns. Also, like the Villa Rotunda, the Capitol was set on a hill overlooking the surrounding countryside, which in the case of Washington, D.C., was basically a malarial river swamp. And now we get to our required work, which is the home of Thomas Jefferson, the the home that Jefferson designed and built for himself, also on a hill, not like most plantation homes by a river. Monticello is actually Italian for Little Hill. Another shout out to Palladio and Italy. I found this on the Monticello website. I thought it was interesting. Jefferson is a, was a self-taught architect, and his main textbook was, as you might have guessed, Palladio's book on architecture. But here's a rough skate, sketch he made uh, when he began building the house, and so actually a, a decade after he began building the house in 1768, it started essentially as a one-room cabin. But what's missing at this point in the design? There is no dome yet. In 1784, Jefferson left Virginia for Paris, where he served as the new United States Minister to France. During that time, he avidly studied European culture. He visited Roman ruins in the south of France, including the Maison Carré. Do you remember that one? He sent home books, seeds and plants, statues and architectural drawings, scientific instruments and notebooks filled with ideas. When Jefferson returned to the United States in 1789, he embarked on a major remodeling that included a dome-shaped room on the third floor, skylights and round windows. The house was finally completed in 1809. By the way, building it pretty much bankrupted Jefferson. And when Jefferson died, his daughter was forced to sell the house to pay his debts. So here is the required College Board image of the plan. Uh, and here, I think somewhat more helpfully, is a labeled version. I can't remember if this is in your notebook. I've stuck the Villa Rotunda plan in the bottom right so that you can make a comparison. What similarities and differences do you see? Well, Jefferson's building is not designed around a circular room, and it's not as perfectly symmetrical, partly because it was added on to in stages. Still, the plan is geometric. It's rational and orderly in the neoclassical style. Neoclassical sculpture likewise harkened back to classical times, especially the tradition of the veristic Roman portrait bust. I've put our required work on the far right there. These were designed to portray their subjects as embodiments of age, wisdom, and public virtue. And again, it suited the spirit of the revolutionary times and of the new republic. So the leading neoclassical portrait sculptor was the Frenchman Jean-Antoine Houdon. By the way, he had won the Prix de Rome I talked about and gone off to Italy. Uh, but he was more influenced by neoclassicism uh, than by the Renaissance or Baroque. At any rate, it's little surprise that when the Virginia legislature wanted to commission a sculpture of George Washington for their state capitol and asked Jefferson for his advice, Jefferson recommended Houdon and indeed commissioned the work. Well, I want to get on to David, and I think the Khan Academy essay covered this work pretty well, but I've noted a few important points on the slide. Fascists got a bad name when Mussolini and then Hitler adopted them as symbols, but they stood for the idea in the Roman Republic that even thin rods became strong when they were bound together in unity, which was an appropriate image for the new 13 states as well as for the citizens of the Roman Republic. Uh, George Washington quite consciously modeled himself on the Roman general Cincinnatus, who after winning a victory, uh, famously refused to stay on as dictator, but instead returned to his farm. Uh, I just note that Cincinnatus was also famous for opposing efforts to give more political power to the plebeians or non-noble Romans, so maybe he wasn't always an ideal democratic model, but it's a good story, and it has a fascinating basis in fact. I used to tell my AP government students that one of the most important events in U.S. history was the Newburgh conspiracy, and they would all stare at me with blank faces, since usually it didn't show up in the AP U.S. history curriculum. And actually, there's good reason for that. It's a conspiracy that didn't go anywhere. But here's what happened. During the unruly days of the Articles of Confederation, a group of Army officers approached George Washington and asked him if he wouldn't be willing to become dictator, rather like the Roman Republic 
public would ask leading citizens, often generals, to be dictators in times of crisis. Washington refused. He was appalled by the idea, but it inspired him to invite a few leading citizens to a dinner party at his home where he suggested that maybe we needed a new and better constitution and we needed it fast. Washington went on to preside over the Constitutional Convention and, of course, to serve as our first president. Sometimes the most important events of history are events that don't happen. I also found it was interesting that Houdon was not willing to make his sculpture simply from a portrait by Charles Wilson Peale, but insisted on coming to Washington and taking an actual plaster cast. And people at the time were amazed at how much this actually looked like Washington. So we have every reason to assume that, in fact, it did. Uh, the bust you see here was made from the same plaster cast by Houdon. I also think we can all agree that Washington was wise to request that Houdon sculpt him in contemporary dress, not classical garb. Congress later commissioned this sculpture for the centennial of Washington's birth. It's based on a sculpture of Zeus and essentially portrays Washington as a buff god. It was enormously unpopular, which shows that Americans do, in fact, sometimes have good taste. Okay, on to neoclassical painting. As you saw earlier from David's painting of the death of Socrates, neoclassical painting reflected the era's fascination with the ancient world, and it also represented a return to emphasis on line, Poussin temporarily beating out Rubens. And you see that here, but neoclassical art is especially important for its political content. I mentioned the revulsion against Rococo art and aristocratic excess in my last lecture, and we looked at the moralistic genre paintings of Greuze and especially of Hogarth. As the 18th century progressed, a new generation of painters used classical history in particular to bolster their call for civic virtue. This is a painting by one of the century's leading women painters, and she portrays the mother of a group of sons who would grow up to lead a democratic revolt against Rome's aristocrats, the Gracchis. The paint, painting captures a famous encounter, which would have been very familiar to the classically educated aristocracy and upper middle class who were the consumers of this kind of painting. So Cornelia was a wife of a Roman patrician. This is the time of the Roman Republic. She was walking down the street with her children. Uh, she came across a woman with a jewelry box who asked Cornelia, where are your jewels? If her husband was so successful, why wasn't she wearing any bling? Cornelia replied to the woman by gesturing to her children, they are my jewels. And Cornelia then told the woman that it was her job to raise her boys to be great men like their father. So here we have just the opposite of that bejeweled and adulterous French aristocratic woman who ran Parisian salons and bared her butt to the world. Uh, the emphasis on self-sacrifice and civic virtue pervades neoclassical painting. It makes it didactic, D-I-D-A-C-T-I-C, -I -I a word that will appear on your test. It means design to teach. It sometimes also makes it rather heavy-handed. I feel often that in uh, neoclassical paintings are trying a little too hard to make a point, but that's a personal prejudice. Of course, also, Shades of Rousseau. This was a gal who knew her place, home and hearth all the way. Here we have what is probably the most famous neoclassical painting. And once again, I have no complaints of the College Board that this is the David painting that's on the list. The Horatii are three brothers who have vowed to settle a dispute between two cities by engaging in combat with three citizens of a rival city. Note the manly, determined brothers being offered swords by their father and the contrast with their weepy sisters. So how does the artist use line to reinforce his message? Well, notice the men are all straight lines and sharp angles. The women are soft and curved. Remember, these are the folks who kicked women out of the French Academy of Painting. I'm going to let my favorite art history commentator, Simon Shama, oh, favorite along with Sister Wendy, talk about this painting and about David. Shama wrote what many consider to be the best historical analysis of the French Revolution, at least available in English. And the entire video is an excellent and dramatic introduction to this important era. That's probably enough to, not enough to sell the whole video to you, but I always try. 
The introductory part, which I'm skipping, by the way, notes that David was first trained by a distant relative, Francois Boucher. Remember, he was the guy who painted all those rosy rear ends. Okay, I don't know how much time you... Oh, oops, sorry, I skipped something. Uh, we've already seen another of David's famous scenes of civic virtue and sacrifice. Just want to remind you of it. You should see parallels to the oath of Horatio. This could very easily show up as an attribution question. Okay, I don't know how much time you have left, but I'm hoping you have time for this three-minute clip about the start of the French Revolution. I'm going to close here, and my next lecture will look at how idealism gave birth to bloodshed and then warfare, and that with that dark turn of history, we also enter a new art historical period, Romanticism.